ladies and gentlemen. Good morning again, welcome back. Welcome to the political update section of this uh, 30th Indonesia update. Uh, my name is Robert Krupp, I'm from ANU, I'll be chairing this session. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce as our speaker today, Sandra Hamid. Sandra trained at the University of Illinois as an anthropologist, but since returning to Indonesia, she's worked not only as an anthropologist, as a researcher, as a journalist, as a development specialist, uh, but now as the country representative for the Ford Foundation. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> I am a historian, so I get some of these things wrong. For the Asia Foundation. <laughs> not all historians get things wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so, let me invite Sandra to the floor. Thanks very much. Selamat siang semua. I'm Sandra Hamid. Um, saya dari Jakarta. I'm from Jakarta and I have a new governor. <laughs> But I don't know who the next president is going to be. Because I have one said saying, Sandra, you will tell us who's the next president is going to be. I don't know. Um, I know most of you who follow um, Indonesian politics. I expect you to start with Jakarta election, the most important elections prior to 2014, sneak review of presidential election. But that would be too predictable. We will get to that, I promise you. But first, let me show you this. <laughs> this star was at the height of his career when a videotape of him in bed with his girlfriend went viral. Riding on the case, conservative groups ate him alive. He was the ultimate enemy of moral values. And in addition, predictably, and as strongly, comes the politicians. They commented very, very harshly on him. To say the least. When the case was tried, however, the prosecutors found it hard to legally implicate him using the pornography law. All students of Indonesia know about this infamous law um, currently still being debated over the efficacy of the implementation. This is the trial case. The trial was lengthy, and the senior received three and a half year, years in jail. Observers who follow his career decided that he's completely and utterly finished. In what seems to be a very conservative country like Indonesia, you have a case of pornography like this, you're finished. Aaron was released two months ago. Two weeks ago, he hit the stage, and he again is a star. <laughs> now, what does it say about Indonesia? Yeah? The, the, the contradiction, and this is to me Beck's answer, the question is the following. On whose behalf were the politicians and the leaders speaking? Who are they accountable to? Who do they represent? What is the Indonesia they represent? Is it a highly pious society? Is it more open, more nuanced, and perhaps quietly more liberal? Throughout the presentation, I want to bring your attention to these three words. The story above on Ariel show contradiction in Indonesia. We will explore these contradictions as I take you through some political landmark of 2012, which is my main task. We will look at it in the form of um, discussion of the party alliance on religious freedoms. And if we have time, we go to anti-corruption as well. This is my first time in the update and even in Australia. So thank you, you for bringing me here. I'm completely starstruck. I've never seen so many big names on Indonesia being in the same room. And I hope I won't be like the beginning of downfall of Indonesia update being the speaker of the 30 years. <laughs> but these two words um, were used by Philly, who is up there, and Tamsa in the 2010 and 2011 updates. Indonesia is stagnating. Indonesia is regressing. So those of you who are frequent uh, attendees of this uh, conference would know this. Some of us in Indonesia, when we read their papers, we nodded our heads. We, we agreed with them. 
we felt that yes, that is true about Indonesia, that we are stagnating, that we are regressing. But we asked the question, why? Why is it that despite the fact that we celebrate our democracy 15 years after the fall of General Suharto, why do we have this contradiction? Why do we have these stagnations and regression? We do elections that we're not getting anywhere we feel in our democracy. My proposition is the following. Because we have not been able to instill accountability to our system, that would be one of the very important answer, I think, to the stagnating and regretting issue. Because of that, we have not been able to get to the next level, so to speak, of democracy. And because of that, while the election is successful, democracy is less so. I would like to emphasize here that by talking about the issue of accountability or let their off, I'm not talking about bad politicians, bad political parties. It's not about that. Because if it were, then elections would have been the antidote for that. Because ultimately, election is about hiring and firing politicians to their offices. So if election is the antidote for bad politicians winning office, bad political parties winning election, we won't have any problems right now because we have been having cycles of elections. The problem we face, and one that causes the regression, I believe, is more systematic, and it permeates many arenas. Sorry. And one of them, as I said, we look at the in-party alliance. There's no rhyme or reason, I said, that we know of. As you know, since 2005, Indonesians have implemented direct election. Yesterday's Jakarta election was the second time in which Jakartans could directly vote for the governor, for our governor. Prior to that, the governor was selected by a member of the House, like Suharto did, and he was selected by MPR at that time. To run in these elections, one has to be supported by political parties. Independent candidates have been allowed, but because of the very steep requirement in getting the ticket to run, going into for, with political parties ticket is still a more preferable way for candidates. To meet the threshold, often, often political parties have to build coalitions. There have been by now hundreds of direct elections, and therefore, easily, there has been now thousands of coalitions being made before direct election. Prior, it, it's the biggest question prior to every direct election. Who is going with whom? They're built on their spotlight. Now, any one of you who has been just one day spent in Indonesia, you would know the fascination that the country has with Sinatron. There's no program. The program follows you everywhere. You cannot go to any public places without being bombarded by Sinatron. With that same of intensity, the media treat party coalition building like Sinatron. So they follow who's going with whom and, and uh, the gossips of this and that and the different levels of political party leaders talking to different ones and all that. They are the focus of discussion on the local level by the local media, on the national media for the national elections. Ironically, the heavy coverage is very thin on the, on the why question. Why do political parties build coalitions? <clears throat> Here I'm going to come try to answer the question from a technical point of view, from the logical point of view. Why would, if you are a political party leader, why would you do a coalition? And then we can see whether or not those answers actually hold. First of all, is to fulfill the minimum threshold of nominating candidates. We talk about that. What are those uh, thresholds? It's 15% of votes uh, or seats in the House. For presidential election, the legislation currently is still being discussed. Um, Currently, it is 25% of votes or 20% of the seats in the PR. Smaller parties in the discussion want, of course, smaller thresholds so they can repeat, which may not be a bad thing, perhaps. We can get to that later. This is the second reason why, if you were a political party leader, you would form a coalition. It's to win election. But I put a question mark there, because in the presidential election, 2009, second round, up to Political parties who do not nominate SBA lost 65% of their constituents. That is to say, if you do not, if you're a political party, you're supposed to have constituents, and your party do not nominate SBA, you lose up to 
So people do not vote based on what their political parties are saying, um, what they should be voting. In the second round election, we don't have the number for the second round, but the first round election of Jakarta election, 35% political parties lost up to 65% of votes of their constituency. So Gorkar may see that Alex Murray should be uh, the candidate, but Gorkar's constituency did not do that. Now, this is the third reason why, if you are a political party, you would want to um, form a coalition. If you're elected, you want to be able to govern effectively. Let's look at that number. In 2009, um, Rizal Sukma, was at the time right after the election, Rizal Sukma spoke here in this podium and he said, Yuri Yonas Coalition is a way to provide stability and support in the parliament. As early as 2010, Tomsa already showed that that's not really the case. He's actually having a problem. In 2011, um, knowing that um, there's a problem, the government made a clear agreement and a clearer agreement more than 2000. Because 2011 already there's agreement, but 2011 there's a clearer agreement that was signed by parties in coalition. It makes it really explicit that parties within coalition not to discredit each other, and parties which do not comply are expected to leave the coalition. But in 2012, the year that we are talking about, PKS voted against the issue of oil subsidy, uh, of oil products that we talked that, that was discussed a little bit. Now, what I want to say here that when the coalition agreement did not pass the test of unity, PKS was expected to quit the coalition, and if it did not, it seems that the coalition really doesn't mean anything. Indonesia watched the the, and overheard very public brawls between the political party leaders. And again, the Sinatron starts. Right? They have followed everywhere, all these PKS leaders and Golkar and Amriza saying this and that, and people are watching it. The president staff communicated that the president would like a new coalition. And then everyone said, oh, that means PKS will be out. Instead of a grand one, but fragile. Signaling that PKS will be decided by their president, his assistant said, quote, this is the time to straighten things up. <coughs> and that lean coalition would be more helpful in ensuring the government's capacity to push for some policies. Now, five months after PKS took that vote, the coalition still intact. In a very quiet way, a decision was made, or was not made, depending on how you want to look at that. Now, if party actually does not win coalition, uh, election through coalition, does not really have support in the legislation, okay, maybe they got, actually they also don't get, don't need that big of a coalition to run an election. So why? Why, why do they make these coalitions? And I believe it has to do with problems that we have right now. Because of coalitions, we have problems of accountability and representation. There. This is, we get to the Jakarta election now. This is the city that um, 7 million voters, almost 7 million voters have uh, just voted yesterday. Since the beginning of 2012, it has been discussed, Jakarta election is the most important local election. It's an election with national importance. With more, many people believe that anyone who secured this race will really have a lot of say in the 2014 election. That's the only thing I can say. <laughs> but the big, heavy weight political figures have say in this election. You see that um, Rabon at the bottom there, uh, nominating the uh, vice governor. On top there is Ibu Megawati with Jokowi. They're jockeying, jockeying for candidates. It showcased the importance of the current elections. Now, let's go back a little bit to the first round, which is on July 12, 2012. There are six rounds, there are six pairs. Six pairs competed in the first round of the Jakarta election. Four of them were nominated by political parties. And of the four, only one ticket was not supported by a coalition. The biggest coalition was formed by Fauzi Bobo, the incumbent. 
Fauzi Bowa entered the race with support from national parties who, or political parties, who targeted, who together control the DPRD Jakarta House, the parliamentary in Jakarta, 40%, way the needed 15% to nominate a candidate. Smaller coalitions were also formed, uh, Borkar and, and all that, and of course, as we know, Jokowi and his uh, vice governor with Felipe and Gerinda alone, just the two of them. <coughs> They control 18%, so only 3% more than the needed uh, threshold. And of course, we know that the constellation of importance here is also the independent candidates for Jakarta election. I think looking for, going forward, this will enter more of the more of the discussion uh, in Indonesian politics. These and independent candidates, and I think Jokowi election has to do with this. We'll, we'll talk about that. Um, these constellations changed right after the result of uh, the elections were out. And yesterday, the last, how was the word? The last two men, two stand, the last, last men standing. Last men standing. The last two uh, were yesterday uh, on the race. And it's basically everyone, all political parties, again, PDP and Gerindra. So about 18% of the House versus 72% of the House. These numbers are important because it really shows the disjuncture between the House, the political parties, and the people. The people voted about 54% um, for Jokowi, and they only 54% of the votes went to Jokowi, whereas actually they only got 18% together in the House. I want to go back to the coalition issue that we talked about. And if you have time, like I do, looking at the numbers and permutations, uh, you, you will know that all major political, this is for Jakarta election, 2000, and, uh, for, for national for presidential election 2004, Jakarta election 2007, presidential election 2009, and then again Jakarta election 2012. What we see here, that all major political parties have been involved in coalition with virtually every other major party at one point or another in Jakarta and presidential elections. <coughs> all sorts of unions have been made, except for PKS and PDIP. And I thought, wow, maybe this is the parties with ideology. You can disagree with their ideology, but maybe this is the party with the ideology. However, their absence cannot be attributed to that because as close as Tangerang, and any one of you know Jakarta, Tangerang is just, if not much, half an hour away from Jakarta. <laughs> PDIP and PKS um, nominated and won Ayrin Rahmi Diani, the city's mayor. The two also were part of coalition in business-oriented Dumai, in Sumatra, or even in very conservative areas such as Pamiglam in West Java, or Mamuju in South Sulawesi, where Sancho here, South Sulawesi. I mean, that's a bit, the only, the reason why they wanted to create their own government is because they wanted a very Islamic uh, uh, look on, on, on their life. And they have been in there, and PKS. Um, so ideology really, there is no stopping parties to come together when it comes to building coalition. Coalition takes precedence over anything else, including, and this is the problem, party identities. And I want to, how am I doing the time? Still okay, I think I can go through this one. Um, this is just a, an illustration about party coalitions and ideology, local politics and national politics. And on the left there is Minister uh, of Home Affairs, Gamawan Fauzi. On the right there is, is Eva Sundari, a House member. And what I'm about to say is not necessarily a criticism to both of them because both of them are actually really good people. Gamawan was a very popular mayor of Seoul, West Sumatra. He was a darling of anti-corruption organizations, a recipient of 2004 Hatta Anti-Corruption Award. In 2005, PDIP nominated Gamawan for a victorious gubernatorial run in the province in alliance with Islamist PBB. The alliance may not have looked natural, but as we know already, 
Nothing is impossible when it comes to coalition building. As the Democratic government's or the conservative positions don't really make sense, not in sync with the LAP position or what we know of their position. In, uh, position. For example, high on Gamawan's priority as governor was, quote, combat immorality among the populace. He supported many local Sharia-inspired bylaws, and for this work, Gamawan was awarded, awarded the Sharia Award from the baby. So he was a recipient of anti-corruption award. He's also a recipient of Sharia Award from the in 2006. In 2009, Gamawan was handpicked by Partido Democrat as the Minister of Home Affairs. On the national level, and this is where it's sur surfacing, Gamawan moved to office, and as soon as that happens, you can see the tension on the national level. So something that could perhaps be buried somewhere in the provincial level, it also entered the national attention, or should enter. Should, more, more people should be thinking about this, but the problem is they don't, but this is the reality. That this, that, that person in purple right there, you can't really see it, that's Eva Sundari. Being uh, secured by the, secured by, by the police because she was a staunch supporter of religious freedom. Yasmin has been reported widely as one of the wor uh, House of Worships uh, whose license been revoked or build, building the, uh, the church being made more, that much more difficult in Indonesia these days. The closing of House of Worship is on the rise this year. I'll talk about religious, religious freedom later. But here, Eva came to visit the Yasmin Church and attack. And after that, not long after that, Eva talked very critically up against the government, including against Gamawan, who her party supported in, in, in West Sumatra, whose, known is always, whose position is always known. But there it is. She's attacked. And her, she, the way she attacked back is by attacking somebody that she used to support. So kind of not making any sense ideologically. Now the question is, how do you, how do you, I don't know what the question is, but how do you answer the questions? I want to move to, 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 to Arena 2, which is the religious freedom. And the year 2012 has not been good for Indonesia's record of religious freedom. Reports show that there is a steady increase on religious violence, both local as well as international organizations measuring the problem recorded as such. Satara Institute for Peace and Democracy, which is one of the most very important organizations recording these issues and working and advocating against uh, 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 violence, uh, freedom, and, uh, and, and freedom of speech, reported 299 violations of religious freedom during 2012, 2011. This trend has continued through the first six months of 2012, with FAs Christians, Shia, and members of the minority Islamic state, Ahmadiyya, facing violence and intimidations. For 2012, for 2012, just up until June, they already recorded 179 violations. So, at the end of 2012, we will surely surprise our record in 2011. Now, I just want to have a quick note for those of you who are really, really into this issue. Just a quick note on, note on the data. Um, there is a problem in getting the data of religious violence. How do, you how do you define what do you actually report? They report many things, condoning discrimination, intimidation, prohibiting of rally, prohibiting of building, surveillance, and all that kind of stuff. There is a, a good, healthy debate about whether or not these are good indicators of religious freedom. However, what I want to say here is that if you, we need to address that problem in terms of research and, and, um, and, and data. But they use the same indicators for many years. So at the very least, while 299 may actually be something else, something lower or something higher, but because they use the same indicators, at the very least we can, we can use to know whether or not it is increasing or decreasing. So their number shows that 
intolerances on the rise. And the latest is the most bloodiest this year, and it will definitely make the number of, of, of intolerance um, data in Indonesia rising, is what had happened in Sampang. This is a conflict between Sunni and Shia followers, with two deaths, five severely wounded, nine houses burned down, and approximately 200 people displaced. I cannot go into detail because it will not do any justice to the problem here in the presentation. What is important to underline here is that despite a minority, Shia observers have been living alongside their Sunni brothers and sisters in Indonesia, particularly in Madura, Sampang, where this took place. NU, the biggest Islamic mass based organizations, will talk about Shia followers as part of their family. But it is also NU followers in Sampang who actually attack their neighbors. Another contradiction. Now, as I said, I cannot go because it's, so, it's, it's very much local politics, the family, brothers bringing into new teachers and, and all that. But the fact here that I want to say, and, and I think it is important for those of you who are, who are uh, uh, looking and researching about religious freedom, this is a landmark. And for those of you who are looking only in terms of political, um, uh, uh, political uh, development in Indonesia, this is a very important thing to look at how the government actually react to this issue. After the attack, four people were arrested. Reports say that five are still on the run. But on the other side, the Shia side, almost 200 lost their home, and they had to move away from their village with the help of the government. Civil society, organ civil society organizations have long criticized this policy of moving the victims, because that was the easiest thing to do that the government has been doing all this time. You create a havoc, the victims are moved. They're being secured somewhere else. This happens in demonstrations. Um, I think some of us perhaps have been in that situation in which you know, two, two factions of demonstration came together. We, people who are working on religious freedom, are usually the ones being told to, they just move, 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 you know, rather than they, it's a hell of the, just, just move, you know. That is not, that is not protecting us. That is not protecting the minority, and we're not even the minority, but it's not protecting people who are working on religious freedom. Then, from electoral politics point of view, to go back to what we're talking about, here's what's important. If you were one of those displaced people, no, oh, that's the picture. If you were one of those displaced people there, you get different messages. From the president, the president admitted that the intelligence has failed the people. This could have been avoided, he said. Please make sure that it's not going to happen again. And the Minister of Religion, Surya Dharma Ali, said, we need more dialogue, but the best thing is for Shia to change to Sunni. <laughs> Let's follow the Sunni. That would be the best thing for them. And he also said, you know, who's talking about relocation is a must? Gabon Fauzi, our friend, also said, who said the relocation is a must? No, uh, we just make it, put them in a, putting them in a secure place. But other cases like Ahmadiyya have also showed that once they move, they cannot go back. They cannot go back to their villages. They are forever displaced. And this is another case. And I deliberately just give there the, num the, 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 the dates just to give you a sense of what we felt in Jakarta at that time. Every single day, there's something moving on the issue. Um, Ulama Council, it starts in March. I'm not going to read it, but it started from the Ulama Council saying that it is haram. And if you look at the, the underlying ones, I underline the state institution that's involved one way or another um, in it. So the Jakarta police make a statement declaring that uh, uh, no, that it should not go ahead. The concept permit is issued by national police, the Jakarta police, said, 
However, Jakarta police doesn't recommend toxic to be done. Okay. Um, and the tourism and creative uh, economy minister also uh, spoke up um, and they said the promoters have to know what the people want. But a couple of months ago, before that, they've already issued a, state, uh, a, a permit to actually do it. But once MOE start to say it's haram, then everyone's backtracked. Um, the National Police report that reportedly told Jakarta uh, Post that they would not issue a permit. And then May 15, uh, the, the hardliners sent reportedly, reportedly because I do know that they actually did that, but on the newspaper, they said that they sent a letter to SBA that the concert should not go ahead. And then FBA reveals that they have bought 157 tickets and basically said, if you do that, we'll create havoc. And they met with DPA, uh, the, third, the third commission, to discuss the rejection of the concept. But then on, on, on May 22nd, the important reports that the National Police will issue their permit with this recommendation. Religious Affairs Ministers, Indonesia Ulama, Tourism, Home Affairs, Gender of Immigration, Manpower, Transmigration. <laughs> so do you let them come? Do you let Gaga come or not? Why can't you just say that? Now, Jakarta police, however, after saying that, they said that if it happens, we are ready to dispatch 4,000 officers to secure the concept. And then, of course, the rally in front of the American embassy. And then, it is Lady Gaga herself who said, you know what, I'm not coming. <laughs> so, Gaga makes decisions. <laughs> How do we know who makes decisions? Who called Gaga? No one called Gaga. Who is actually responsible for all of this? Ten more minutes. Okay, I have. Uh, I'm fine. <laughs> I think what we have here is the known fact that Indonesia is a democracy. But Philly and Tomsa is are right. It is stagnant and even regressing. And I think that has to do with the fact in which coalitions are made and they dilute the identity of political parties and result in a lack of ability for citizens to actually hold their officials accountable. As I mentioned earlier, that is basically what the election is supposed to be, is to hold their the officials, the elected officials accountable. But because it is so diluted, we don't know who is actually to blame or in a positive turn to give rewards when you actually have positive things going on in your country. Everything is gotong royong, togetherness. Now, elections have been successful, but democracy is less so because of that. And the last point, Joko's victory, and of course I just put that last night, his victory means something to the trend of coalition building, I believe, in Indonesia. If I were a political party leader, I would be thinking right now, hey, maybe actually this coalition is building, haven't really been working out. With 18%, if you get a good candidate, believable, maybe you can actually win this, this election. Maybe if you were a political party, maybe you would think that. But I don't know, because I'm not a political party. But I believe that that, that means something. Jokowi's victory means so many things to Indonesia. For the religious freedom issue, <laughs> so so who is the real Indonesianist? Who is that guy with the yellow uh, with the orange scarf? You cannot learn and study Indonesia for thirty years and not know. <laughs> that is Omar Iran, the king of Dangdut. The person who can say that somebody, something is haram and not haram. <laughs> who can say that a movement in Damut is not allowed and that kind of movement is allowed. Yeah, and next to it is Fauzi Bowo. This is in their campaign. Omar Irama said that Jokowi ticket is problematic because his vice was Chinese Christian. And more so, he said Jokowi's mother is even Christian. But of course, Jokowi's mother is not Christian, but that's not the point. 
he is, he steered the, 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 the whole religious debate into Jakarta election. And that's why I said the Ecoist victory means something to religious buildings and also means something to positive to religious freedom issue is that because hopefully politicians will finally learn that it's not actually going to do them good because that's not what people want. Maybe all of this time there's been a huge disjuncture between the rhetoric of the politicians and the loud minority vis-a-vis -vis the populace. And that has been proven many times in local ele in, in, in legislative elections. As has been noted by a lot of political party, uh, of political uh, scientists. So hopefully, because this is a direct election, because it is so straightforward, that they actually uh, learn about this. And hopefully, um, that because coalitions will 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 be looked upon in a very critical way right now by politicians, or I do hope so that finally we can use elections to hire and fire our, our, our officials. That finally elections can mean that we can have a better democracy in Indonesia. Not just better elections, but better democracy, more substantial, more protection to the very values of democracy, including religious freedoms. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sandra. Towards the end, I'm not sure whether, whether we were going to end on a positive or a uh, positive, because discouraging note, but again, very positive. So our discussant for the politics section is uh, Dr. David Bouchier from the University of uh, Western Australia. He's a long-term observer of uh, Indonesian politics, uh, has uh, written extensively on Indonesian political philosophy, and work in the world. Thank you. Um, I'd like to congratulate the uh, yeah, um, uh, speaker for <laughs> Sandra for, uh, for that wonderful talk and she's a lot more across the details of Indonesian politics um, than I am so I'll be speaking a little bit more in general terms. Um, I was pleased to see that she didn't use the analogy, the cliche of the half uh, uh, full glass which is the very sort of, uh, uh, um, it's something that's been referred to a lot, whether the grass glass is half full with Indonesian democracy or is it half empty. Um, there's been a tendency, especially among outside observers over the last 10 years or so, to talk about um, the glass being half full, whereas a lot of insiders are talking about you know, it being much more critical of Indonesian democracy uh, for that period. I think in the last few years, the last couple of years, there's been a, a closing of that gap and that, um, that outsiders are actually becoming more pessimistic, um, like their Indonesian colleagues, and there are um, there's more and more talk of um, uh, what the Kennedy, uh, the Harvard Kennedy School's 2001 assessment uh, called um, yeah, economic oligar oligarchy and political collusion. Um, there's more and more talk of political deadlock, um, adrift, stagnation. President is a lame duck and so forth. Um, SPS now is about two thirds of the way through his um, second term, and he is for the first time having to give up power uh, according to a constitutional rule. Um, this is the first time this has happened in Indonesia, and it's creating a sense of um, yeah of, of looking forward to the next uh, regime to see what's going to happen. Therefore, there's a lot of um, emphasis in everyday Jakarta politics, a lot of uh, focus on, on uh, obviously the next the next president, and more and more I think his, um, his rule uh, is being, or his authority is being, being zapped. I haven't heard the word lame duck being used very much in Indonesia, I'm not even sure what the word would be for that, but uh, um, but it's it's certainly, uh, the sense that you get is that it's, you don't have to listen to SPA anymore, I think somebody uh, FBA said that the other day. Um, Sandra referred uh, a lot to uh, accountability, and she was especially despairing of the, the tendency of ideology-free and principle-free parties to enter into apparently random and promiscuous coalitions um, in order to get a share of the spoils at the regional and national level. It's very anti promiscuity, I can see. Um, one effect of this uh, has to make Indonesians very cynical about uh, parties, 
and have very weak loyalty to parties, undermining the quality of Indonesian um, democracy. Um, while this doesn't apply equally across all parties, it is borne out in surveys across the years showing that up to 75% of Indonesians report not feeling any strong attraction to any political party. Um, and between the elections 2004, the national election 2004 to 2009, I think 41% of voters actually changed uh, their vote. Um, and another effect of that promis uh, promiscuous power sharing, as Sandra said, was that it makes um, it next to impossible for, for voters to reward or punish uh, candidates that they've, that they've elected. They don't know what they stand for and that they've, um, uh, or what part they played in making the legislation. Um, and so there's a sense of blamelessness about the whole, or passing about the whole legislative process, which makes it, yeah, very difficult for, for um, people to know what's going on. A couple of points I'd like to make about that is, is yes, I, yes, I agree, I very much agree, um, but a lot of those criticisms could actually be applied to any um, uh, democracies, including, including Western democracies. There's been a, a tendency in Western democracies for people to lose contact with, uh, with uh, Sort of loyalty towards particular political parties. Uh, political parties in Australia are having this problem at the moment of people not wanting to join them. I think the Queensland branch of the ALP is uh, offering uh, five dollar memberships at the moment, uh, and the possibility of uh, being selected for um, uh, for an election for candidate, candidacy within six months. So they're obviously fairly desperate to get people uh, in uh, to the to the system. Um, so there's a cynical cynicism in, in, in Australia as well, probably because of the sort of the, the convergence of ideologies and the fact that there aren't that there isn't there aren't those ideological issues to um, rally around uh, as they used to be. Um, the observation that voters have no way of uh, attributing reward or blame to individual parties is likewise not an Indonesian problem, but a feature of any multi-party uh, coalition government. I think democracy is is just by its nature pretty messy, uh, especially when you've got those, uh, a lot of small parties and they have to enter into coalitions. Um, they're known in the political science literature to be sort of more inefficient, uh, more unstable and uh, inconsistent governments when you've got those kind of coalitions going. <coughs> and where decision making is, showed among, uh, is shared among many parties, it's to be expected that there'll be a degree of sort of buck passing and so forth. But there is, I think, uh, an upside to that um, to that sharing of power, <coughs> and that is that parties of coalition governments with lots of small parties can be more responsive uh, to uh, each party because they have to be taken into account, um, and there's more um, give and take going on. Uh, this is a, there's always negotiation between parties. There's always um, uh, discussion and so forth, which is. Uh, definitely good for a country which has got potential, you know, sort of schisms going through, which we've seen explode in the past. So I don't think the negotiation that goes on between the parties is necessarily a bad thing. Um, uh, certainly, Australian politicians talk about that kind of committee work and that kind of uh, inter-party kind of work that, that goes on behind the scenes in Parliament as being the most rewarding and sort of uh, fulfilling kind of uh, work that they can do. But certainly, you wouldn't want to see. Um, you know, parties getting into into major conflicts in Indonesia, and this is one way, I suppose, this, uh, of of that being accommodated, that that um, or avoided. Um, and so we should remember that the reason that it's necessary to have big coalition governments is, is democracy itself. Um, for as long as Indonesia allows the, allows the formation of parties and stays with proportional representation in the DPR, um, I think it's very unlikely that we'll ever see. Uh, a single party gaining enough votes to rule in its own right. Um, an alternative could be a kind of an Italian solution or a you know, Greek solution where, you, where they don't have any um, party people at all in the cabinet, they just have a, a technocracy, uh, technocratic cabinet. But this would be, uh, yeah, even less, this might solve some of the problems uh, that you were talking about, but would also be less accountable um, and it would be more prone to charges of illegitimacy as well. Um, there is a proposal to create single member uh, constituencies, 560 of them in Indonesia, and have, um, have people just elected one uh, member per, per a constituency. Um, but that um, yeah, hasn't put up, and it would, uh, this would have the effect of getting rid of a lot of the small parties, which would be really difficult to do in the current situation because people would get very angry. Um, we've also seen um, 
uh, have to remember that a lot of unpopular parties and others at the regional level have been voted out of office, and so um, there is uh, some degree of uh, accountability going on there all the time. Um, I think in the spirit of optimism, it's um, even if it's only a 30% 30, 30 plus, 30% uh, full optimism, I think it's important to, uh, to mention that, yeah, that uh, election turnout rates in Indonesia are still quite high by world standards. Um, 84% in 2004 general election, 71% in 2009 in the Jakarta, <coughs> first round of the Jakarta election, 63%, and that lines up uh, pretty well against the sort of um, uh, figures from US, UK, and, and India. Um, other poll results are worth uh, mentioning. 62% of Indonesians say that democracy is preferable to any other kind of government, and 78% view voting as a way to influence decision making. Um, high level of confidence in, in electoral in institutions. Um, I think it's worth sort of pointing out that some of the scenarios that are not being uh, canvassed at the moment too. The, um, uh, the fact that the SPE is going to stand down at the, in 2014, there's no debate about that. Nobody's saying, will he stand down, will he not? Um, it's, it's just taken for granted that he's going to. Um, it, nobody's talking about a military coup, um, unlike in places like Thailand, where there's always in the background this possibility. Uh, that's just not on the agenda. Nobody's talking about that in Indonesia. Um, nobody, none of the parties um, are talking about getting rid of parliamentary democracy, uh, as they were in the 1950s in Indonesia. Um, nobody's talking about reviving the anti-subversion law and so forth. And so there is a good news that story there. Um, in that democracy is now being sort of normalized. I definitely agree that the quality needs to get, uh, get a lot better, but the accountability is not completely absent from the system, and the system there is a, um, yeah, there, it, is, uh, it is working, and for, despite all these shortcomings, SBA has, has uh, proved that democracy can be sort of both legitimate and stable. Um, having been optimistic about that, I did want to make a couple of comments about um, 2014. Um, in the, in the uh, presentation so far, this is a question, this is obviously hanging over a lot of other questions, you know, who's going to take over in 2014. I think um, there is reason to worry, um, not only about what that person will do, but about the future of, uh, even the future of um, the democracy as we know it in Indonesia. The polls, um, I've looked at quite a lot of them, um, have been showing a pretty a steady um, rise in support for uh, Prabowo. There's two main candidates there at the moment um, that have more or less declared. One is, um, one is uh, Abu Rizal Bakri, the other one is, is um, Prabowo, so the Anto. Both of them obviously are sort of deeply entrenched New Order people and in a sense represent the worst of, of the new order, the cronyism and the repression. Um, none of them have got, have got uh, uh, reformati credentials at all. In fact, you know, I think uh, in case of Prabowo, he'd say he's be as, as anti reformasi he was as anti reformasi as it's possible to get by kidnapping uh, representatives of the movement and uh, uh, probably killing some of them as well. Um, the, the vote, um, when you take into account second choices and third choices, Prabowo, um, according to the um, uh, Roy Morgan, is getting about 34% of the vote. So if he can get into a situation where he gets into a, um, a two-party race, then I think that he's got, a, he's got a quite a good chance. Uh, Greg Feely warned me last night, it's very dangerous to be, uh, to be uh, uh, making any predictions at this stage because so much can happen. Two years is a very long time in, in Indonesian politics and it's possible, I mean, that um, if, a, if a new candidate can come up who's got a reputation for being clean and so forth, they can shoot through and, and uh, become a big third force. But on current polling, it looks like that's, um, well, yeah, that we'd have to take Prabowo uh, seriously as a potential president uh, in Indonesia. Um, what sort of a president would he be? I think, think Putin, <laughs> think <laughs> Taksin. Sort of a Putin Taksin. Um, uh, uh, you won Oscar in, in an interview with the Huffington Post a couple of weeks ago. Um, uh, it was quite striking. He's not a not a uh, liberal, well, not a lefty, let's say. Um, um, he was he was saying Prabowo will become a Putin, um, and this is worth taking seriously, I think, because I think somebody like um, Prabowo, or let's say Prabowo, <laughs> in power, thank you, uh, is likely to chafe at any restrictions on the presidential authority and be bad for um, 
uh, well, federally sort of undermine the sorts of uh, democratic controls that have been built up over the last couple of, um, well, the last decade. So I think it is important to take him seriously and that democratic groups in Indonesia ought not to take existing freedoms uh, and democratic achievements for granted. Yes, push for more democracy, push for more openness and so forth, but it's come to the point where, even where, where there's this possibility of a war coming in, start thinking about how to actually defend those, uh, those gains that have been made. <laughs> uh, and, and make, a, make a movie about <laughs> some, of the, some of the movies that uh, the law has been financing, you know. He's obviously got a very, very slick uh, PI campaign. Uh, he looks great on TV. Well, he's, he's a very good speaker. Some of you would like to have a look at the, uh, uh, the speech he gave in Bali to the extraordinary Congress of Gurindra. Um, you can see that he's got a very um, yeah, magnetic sort of style, and I can easily imagine him um, as, as, a, as an Indonesian president. But I think he would be um, very uh, dangerous for Indonesia and destructive of uh, international relations for Indonesia. Well, I don't know about that. He, he, I can imagine that he, he could be a good president, but he will be. Um, uh, on balance, I think is sort of a very, very authoritarian president and somebody who's going to set back relations between Indonesia and the rest of the world. So if you'd like to talk about some of those issues, we do it after. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thanks very much, David. Ladies and gentlemen, we started 10 minutes late, so we're, I will take 10 minutes from your lunch for uh, discussion and questions. As before, we'll take uh, questions in three batches from the from this side of the room, the centre on this side. So we'll start this time with uh, this side of the room. Uh, okay. So the gentleman, and then... So, yep. And then I'll replace and then the gentleman. I just... Um, the uh, relations. Could you introduce yourself, please? Yeah, a couple of years yeah, from now, I'd imagine. Um, well, sorry, my name is Sarah uh, Yonsupi. I'm from Palace Kaanwa. Um, for the elections in two years' time, uh, if you look at the two main contenders, uh, does it mean that disclosure of pecuniary interest is no more relevant? both have all had questions. Thank you. Thank you. No? Thank you. Um, I'm Merle Whiplash. <coughs> There's a question I wanted to ask Senator Hamid to pursue further. Um, the connection between the political system and religious freedom or the religious world in general is something which is uh, central to to my latest book. I hope you've all noticed it's out there. Ten percent of this Don't miss it. Um, the, the process, as I see it, has been one of basically a fundamental social change over the last 30 years, 50, 30, 40 years, of a, a, a more religious society. It's not unique to Indonesia. It's happened when we look at North America. You know, this is happening elsewhere. Could we have the question, please? <laughs> well, the question is this. In, in my view, what is happening basically is that in more religious society, democratic politicians who are looking for support decide that they should accommodate this more religious society. It makes openings for religious leaders to exercise influence considerably. And I suppose the, the most classic expression of that was when <laughs> SPY, opening the Monte Sunana conference in 2005, said to, to the MOE, we, we as a government are open to the Papua's of the MOE at any time to me or the Minister of Religion or the Chief of Police, so that we know what we should be doing as a government. And we know that MOE and Papua's have, are in fact interpreted as if they have the force of legislation by the police force. So there is an opening, including the more extreme and public forms of religious elites. What I do not understand from Sandra's comments is how that connects specifically with the issue of coalition building. Thank you. One more question. Uh, hello, my name is Michael from Deakin University in Victoria. 
Um, thank you, Sandra, for the great presentation. And you touched a lot on the issue of religious freedoms in Indonesia in connection with elected leaders. I just wondered if you wanted to talk a little bit about the other big issue in Indonesia, which I think is the future of the Kapeka, uh, particularly the role of elected leaders in the future of that organisation, and then also looking forward to the next presidential election. I think that's something that the Kapeka, or the future of the Kapeka, also relies on as well. So I wonder if you wanted to talk about that as well. Thanks, Mark. Sandra, feel free to respond to David as well. Um, can I just talk from my own guy? Um, on the disclosure of money, um, the, just about, I think, two weeks ago, uh, two weeks ago, the, um, the audit process started on, on political parties. And Gurindra, actually, was one of the parties um, that actually complied, despite the fact that uh, the audit process, the internal audit process was not done, was not completed yet. But Gurindra is a modern party, and so they complied, they did audit, and they actually complied. Interestingly enough, the one that has not complied, I saw, I don't know when I left, was Pan, the supposedly more, more intellectual thinking and all that kind of party. So, I think the contenders of the 2014 election um, know that that is actually what's being looked at on them, as particularly uh, Abu Zal Bakri and, and, and Prabowo. Um, I think they try to be more preemptive to, to, to uh, uh, against uh, attack on on that issue. Um, so they actually were surprisingly they're the ones who are actually much more proactive in terms of telling people. Of course, you know, the, the uh, anti-corruption organizations are talking about, uh, for example, how they, um, they did not report the whole thing, they, there's a lot of things that still need to be looked at, but one of the matters on the image level, they're very aware of that, and I think we're going to see a lot of that uh, coming to, to 2014. Um, on the coalition building and, and religious freedom, if I if I, just, if I understand that the question is, and correct me if I'm wrong, so what does the, the, uh, the freedom of, um, the, the religious freedom issue, the diluted responsibility between the state and then comes MOE, they can have a say also on what is and is not, and you actually yourself say as if their fatwa actually is a binding um, uh, legislation, so to speak. Uh, th that is the key word, this is the S in. And in, in some communities, well not communities, in some minority group, that actually they, they felt that that is a ticket for them to actually do that. We saw that in the attack of prior, prior attack to Ahmadiyya, for example. Um, there's a, in, in the, some of the reports that I mentioned done by Satara, there's some other organizations also that have done a lot of research on this. They could see the relationship between a fatwa and an attack on minority. So it is an important, it's given importance, I guess also is what, what you're saying. And what does that mean with coalition building? Well, that's, if there are political parties that actually want to support that, then say so and be one. And if there are any political parties who do not agree with that, say so and be one. Be true to your identity and ideology. The coalition does not allow that to happen. Everyone's with everyone. And so I want to know if the freedom of expression and religious freedom is very important for me, I should have a couple of political parties that I could go to knowing that their agenda is that. It's not on anyone's agenda because of that. And when you then turn that into electoral politics, you do not know if that is of importance to you. You do not know who to support and who to blame for the where, where we are right now. I mean, David was saying, you know, protect your protect your freedom. I want to. Which party should I vote for? You know, there's no which politicians actually really is responsible. So that's 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 the problem. And the the so the coalition bill, this is this picture, I don't know if I explained to you. The one on the left, that's not Jokowi's supporter. That's the exact the same supporter of the same person. Yeah? 
this one saying that it's haram, 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 and then they also have a machinery doing support with, in that way. So what this actually Posey Boas stand for in terms of morality, if you think that those is immoral, which I don't think they are, but those are people who think that's immoral, should be questioning that. Um, I like that picture. <laughs> um, and on the KPK issue, actually, I meant to uh, I meant to include that in in, in the talk, and I will definitely include that in the paper. KPK is a very interesting um, case on the accountability issue. We know that this current KPK right now, um, when it was uh, when the commissioners were being uh, selected, there's a lot of debate as to which one which should, which should be the head and which one will be more. Um, so more, more lenient, uh, not linear, lenient, more lenient to uh, SBA's uh, administration or uh, the Partai Democrat, which one's more lenient to Golkar and all that kind of stuff, and everyone's talking about that. Actually, knowing some of these people who are actually very quite close with the, some of these commissioners, that's not, that's not even high on their agenda. They are these business commissioners, um, and you can see from what they what they have done so far and they have surpassed a lot of the records that other commissioners have done before the problem is that who do i reward for kapika success i don't know who do i reward for kapika success because kapika is not does not belong to any political party and it shouldn't be it shouldn't belong to political parties but if I want to reward someone for the success of Kapika, or a party for the success of Kapika. I don't know who. And again, because everything is so politicized and everything through the process of confirmation now that in the House makes it look like um, like they, don't, they want to disown these people, basically, even though in the end they voted for them. So there's so many different contradictory statements from them at the, at the beginning at the establishment of the commissioners. And then now that the commissioners have already established, they have run with it and they have been doing great stuff, basically. Which got highest approval, one of the highest, actually the highest approval uh, by um, Indonesians to uh, state institution is for Kapeka. Now, who's going to benefit from that? Um, yeah. Thanks very much. Take a couple of questions from the middle block. Thank you. Okay. Um, this gentleman and Greg. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, a very, very good presentation from both of you. My name is Rudy Purva from Amsterdam International. I picked uh, two points that uh, uh, raised by Sandra and also David. Very maybe I remember one presentation last year we talked about the media, about the role of media. Of, uh, Could you yeah. get quickly to the question? The question is short term. It seems to me that individuals' popularity is very important here in the coming election of 2014. And looking at the, the, the story that SBY was some kind of victimized, uh, said by Megawati, Jokowi, and Ahok looked to be as well victimized as well in the media, in the story of the media. And it seems to me that Provo will be uh, victimized as well, put as an outsider or opposition of the government. So I think if you touch that area, uh, the media can use that kind of st story so that people can support Provo idea. How do you comment on that? So putting them outside, putting them as a victim of the situation in the past, uh, as a victim. It was checked before by Habibi, for instance. And people remember that story more than, than what he did in the past with uh, with uh, with uh, East Timor or whatever. So, okay. So, so, so yeah. Yeah. it's a good question. question. Thank you. Great. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> you. Uh, just a question for Sandra and. You had that uh, in one of your early slides, those two words, contradiction and disjuncture. Yeah. And we can see you and lots of other people have made clear 
the way in which, for example, Islamist groups have put pressure on politicians and governments and how they've responded. But I was more interested in getting your thoughts on what you think is happening in society, and particularly this notion of contradiction and disjuncture. Is society itself increasingly fragmented, polarised between those people who are more Islamist and those who are less so? Or is there, in fact, a growing degree of ambivalence, particularly in big cities where people are both pietistic, but also the Ariel example might be one example. You could look at the popularity on TV of, of all sorts of shows where women are actually quite skimpily dressed and they have very high ratings. And so is there a degree of ambivalence in Indonesian society, which is also part of the problem when you're looking at this narrowing religious Narrow, narrowing the space. Thank you. We're not going to have time for a third round, so I'll take one question from this side of the room. Ross. Thank you, Ross McLeod from ANU. Um, Sam, I just wonder if you could clarify a couple of things for me. You, you said that uh, we're all feeling euphoric about Jokowi's victory yesterday. But you also said that he only has the support of parties representing 18% of the seats in the Jakarta uh, Debe and Day. So is that going to be a problem for him actually getting anything done? Uh, and the, the second bit of clarification is you were sort of criticising PKS for voting against the coalition on raising fuel prices, but surely PKS wasn't the only one of the coalition that uh, went against the coalition. I, I think Bakri was out there in... in you know, in the big headlines uh, saying that he was against raising fuel prices also, but, but you didn't mention Volcan. Yeah. Singkat saja. Okay, Pak. Singkat saja, just very quickly. The media is very loud. It's like everything is in the media, but voting wise, they didn't vote against it. So only PKS actually voted against it. Volcan gave license for the uh, the the price to be, you know, help me, the price to be uh, adjusted if the world price becomes to a certain percentage. And so it's with qual qual it's with qualification that they approve that. But in the media, it's a different story. But when you look at the votes, actually, it's different. What we decided is actually very different. And so that's the. PKS was not the only one who disagreed. We know Pedro Ito opted out. We know Garindra stayed and uh, didn't vote uh, for that, so vote against it. Um, so PKS is not the only one, but it's the only one in the coalition to actually do that. And that's my point. Um, I think I did. Oh, uh, Yeah, I think I should ask you. Um, because this is, your, <laughs> this is your area, but I agree with you um, that I think it is really the ambivalence um, of it all. The disjuncture that I, I actually forgot to mention more about the disjuncture. The topic that issue shows the disjuncture between the PR, the PR, and the people. I mean, there's just people want one, the other one wants, you know, other things, you know. There are many examples of that, Kapeka, study tour, and you know, things that are obviously hurting people and people are against that, they better just take the care and make policies a different way. Um, about the, the, the Islam, um, Islamic identity and the disjuncture and, 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 um, and identity, I think I agree with you that ambivalence may be the word. I give you an illustration. Um, the Asia Foundation is often being attacked for our work with organizations that promote religious freedom. Um, we are openly attacked by many minority groups. Um, and also subject to Twitter um, uh, uh, messages uh, about the Asia Foundation and, and the liberals and all that kind of stuff. And so, uh, one of our staff tried to look because some of this uh, account you can actually see like, who's actually tweeting. People who are so angry with us, like really, really angry with us, in their account, like, you know, like all these girls wearing all that kind of stuff, and they're talking about anti openness, anti, you know, more, more conservativeness. I don't understand. I don't. The 
because it's just very, very um, schizophrenic almost. Uh, and so I think, you know, you got a lot of research on the <laughs> subject to, 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 to look at. I mean, we, I don't think we have the answer. But I do think that media plays into that. They're, you know, the, the politicians are being, you know, really play, try to play that card. Not very really cleverly, but they try to play that card. As I said earlier, it actually didn't actually um, help them, both in the legislative elections. We have those numbers, right? Everyone, I mean, any students of Indonesian politics know that. In the legislative election, it didn't actually work out. In the, in the, um, um, and definitely, I, I don't want to be seen as, as um, euphoric, so uh, I'm just going to say thank you instead of joking. Now, so I think it is, it is a, it is a very ambivalent and not thinking in making these decisions, not thinking, there's not enough thinking uh, going on. I do believe that piety is on the rise. But I used to think that piety on the rise doesn't mean that hardening of values is also on the rise. Hardening of values, is that a word? Like, <laughs> but you know what I'm talking about. Um, but I think currently maybe, um, maybe that needs to be qualified. Um, maybe. I think the jury is out. But if elections is any, is any um, and the indication of that, uh, I think we know that the general populace still believe in the election. I also want to uh, address a little bit of what David said. And I agree with him with all of the indicators of that, the fact that Indonesia is democracy, that voter turnout is still high, and all this kind of stuff. And this is why I'm saying Indonesia is a democracy. It is a stable democracy. The point that I'm trying to make is that how do we make it a more meaningful democracy? And as electorate, as part of the city, part of the electorate, I don't know how, and maybe it is incumbent upon you, the thinking people in this audience, the theorists, um, to give us examples of how is it being done with a situation like us, you know, open party system and multi-party system like in Indonesia, how, how do, how is it done? Because I think, I think we need to get to the next level. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you all for coming. Thank you for coming. Thank you.